Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary. We are excited to have you here with us today. As you guys are, are filing in here, we'll go ahead and start our service off this morning with the song. Hopefully you all know this one. This is Angels from the Realms of Glory. Sing with us. You can have a seat. Good morning, Calvary. Man, it's already December. Can you believe it? You know what that means? It means I get to listen to Pastor Jason rave about Christmas for the next 20 days. It's going to be a long month. But anyways, welcome to Calvary. My name is Ryan, and I am one of the announcers here at Calvary. And I have two things to talk to you guys about this morning. The first one is the special Christmas service times coming up. So, on December 23rd, we're going to be having a special Christmas Sunday breakfast at 9.45 a.m. It's completely free breakfast for anybody that shows up, and it's going to be held next door in the gymnasium, okay? And if you are, want to attend that, you need to sign up on a list out in the foyer. It's on the foyer board, just so that we can know how much food we need to have and how many people to plan on. Uh, also, on December 23rd is the Christmas Sunday service. It's going to be a special Christmas celebration service from 1045 to noon, and there are no connect groups that morning, okay? Just the main service. And then on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we're going to be having a service at 6 p.m., okay? This is a special uh, joyous Christmas music service, and the sermon title will be Message of great joy. I really want to stress how important it is to invite people to this. Christmas is one of the times of year where people are most willing to accept invitations to church. So, out on the table in the foyer, we have some invitation cards that you can hand out. You can give them to co-workers, friends, family, anybody. So, I just really want to stress how important it is to invite people, because this is when people are most willing to come by. And lastly, um, if you notice in your bulletin, there's a little ticket that says Nina's and Valley Heights Christian Academy. What that is for is um, tomorrow night from 4 o'clock to 10 p.m., uh, members from the VHCA Student Council will be standing outside of Nina's with these little coupons. So if you go to Nina's and you use this little coupon and you hand it to the uh, cashier as you're paying for your meal, uh, whoever, whatever money is spent from these tickets, 20% of that will go to the student council budget for Valley Heights. This is really important for us because we need this money that we can, so that we can help continue to spread the news about our school. So if you want to come get some Ninas tomorrow night and you want to help out the VHCA student council, just bring this little coupon by and come on help us. And I think that's all I have to do today. Wow, that wasn't very much, was it? Eh, whatever. So I guess now we can go into our greeting time. So now if you'd like, you can stand up, walk around, shake some hands, and greet each other.
hopefully by now you're feeling very welcomed and, and appreciated and happy you're here. As we are uh, getting ready for our next song here, I wanted to point something out. It's not often that we open to this, this empty space between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but this represents uh, about 400 years that God's plan seemed to just be on hold. 400 years, that's, that's longer than our nation has been founded. Just to put that in perspective, Frankly, people got on with their lives. They started doing normal things. And the night that Jesus was born was just a night like any other. They didn't realize what was happening until those angels that we sang about came down and, and said something to them. But something amazing did happen that night. And the next song that we have is going to be a new one for us. It's called Hope Was Born This Night. And it kind of highlights the fact that it was a normal night that became holy.
Amen. Thanks for singing with us so you can be seated. All right. If I can grab one of those stands here, which would be the best one for me to grab? Maybe that one? Awesome. Thank you. How are you guys doing this morning? 
Good. Well, we are in the Christmas season. Anybody excited about that? All right. Hey, I don't know about you. I love Christmas time. Such a wonderful, unique time of year. And especially where we can focus in on, where we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. Amen? Anybody with me on that? Yeah, so this is also a busy time of year for our church. And so uh, lots of things going on. Just want to bring you up to speed on some of the things that are happening. Uh, in your bulletin, there is an announcement about uh, our nominating committee. And they are meeting, they are taking nominations and preparing that for the annual meeting meeting for January. Now, if you know anyone that you would like to suggest as a nominee for deacon or trustee or for a school board member, please do check your bulletin. You'll see the names of those who are on the committee and please let one of those uh, persons know. Secondly, I do want to remind you that after our service this morning, we are going to be voting on our budget for next year. And uh, this is a little different. And the reason why, as our leadership teams have met, it's really a good idea to have your budget in place and confirmed before your financial or what we call your fiscal year begins. There's a lot of reasons for that, including some legal reasons. So we really want to try and get our budget set before we actually begin our financial year. We are expecting that this meeting should shouldn't take very long. Uh, we will end our service. We'll give some time for those who would be leaving to leave, just a few moments, and then we're going to call the meeting to order. And that is our only area of business for this special meeting. A special business meeting is to cover uh, the budget. So please, if you are an active member, please make sure you do stay for that. And again, to vote, you must be a member of the church. A couple of things I'm excited to share with you. Number one is our greeting team is back in place. So that is really exciting. Uh, we have uh, some from the church who make up that team and even more that we're looking to bring on board. But I'm excited because every Sunday we're going to have people that are stationed by doors and, and by hallways as people come in and to be greeted. I think that is so important. And that will just add, I think, to the friendliness and the warmth of our church. Now at the end of our service today, another thing I want to share with you is super exciting is we're going to celebrate with someone because they are getting baptized today. So uh, Andreas is going to be getting baptized right over there. Yes, and we are so excited. Uh, and when you hear his testimony, you're going to hear God has done some incredible things in his life. He is saved. He is a believer. And so we'll be celebrating with him for that. Lastly, make sure if you have those invitation cards for our Christmas sermons, especially for the Christmas Eve message and our time together, invite people. Get those invitation cards out. I can promise you for Christmas Eve, the message is going to be heavily gospel or Oriented. And wouldn't it be great if somebody was here Christmas Eve and they didn't know the Lord and after hearing that gospel message there was some new people who became part of God's family. Wouldn't that just be awesome? So let's be inviting. Amen. Let's be inviting. So we are going to start our time, what a, what a great way to start our time today with some communion uh, and we think about Christmas, we think about the birth of the King and, and the celebration in our heart for that. But in this time we can also remember what Jesus came here to do, to be obedient to his Father even unto death and to offer us salvation. So we enter into this time of course in serious reflection, but we also do enter into this time with great thankfulness and with joy. Before we take of our communion today, just a few things I want to remind you is to partake of communion. We ask that you are a person who believes in Jesus Christ as Savior. You do not need to be a member of this church, but we would ask that. Secondly, be sure to be examining your heart before you partake. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says it's very important that we partake in a way that is worthy. We want to partake of, of the bread and the cup in a worthy manner. And lastly, after we have concluded, make sure you take that cup and there's a, a place right in front of you, the chair in front of you, you could put your cup. So let's enter into our communion time. Would you please pray with me as we pray over the bread? Father, we thank you so much that we can come together and celebrate this wonderful Christmas season. But Father, we also focus now on what Jesus came here to do, and that is to die on a cross for us. Father, we know that the body of your son was broken for us. We think about how that body was broken. Wow, what an incredible sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. But God, we are, we are really just amazed at how much love 
your son Jesus had for us to do this on our behalf willingly that he went like a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, Father, we just pray now over this bread and, and we want to remember how Jesus uh, truly did die. He, he died a, a complete death and it was on our behalf. His body was broken for us. We thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to share from the book of Matthew chapter 26 verse 26 which says while they were eating Jesus took bread he gave thanks and broke it gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body let us remember as we partake together would you pray with me over the cup Jesus we thank you for your blood your precious, precious blood, Jesus, that you spilled out for us. And Jesus, we know as that lifeblood that left your body, as it flowed, Lord, that that was really the blood that would give us new life. And so, Jesus, we celebrate your blood. We thank you again that you were that lamb that so freely went and died for us. And now, Lord, we know that you want us to be living our lives in a way that we would be bringing you glory, putting ourselves down for the good of others, to serve, to love, even to the point of dying for someone else in the same way that you did for us. That's what your word says. So we thank you for this blood because by your death again, Lord, and what you have done in our lives through salvation, for those of us who have accepted you as Savior, you have changed us. We are different here today than we used to be. We give you praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Once again, I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 26, but now verses 27 to 30. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered it to them saying, Drink it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We want to again remember as we partake together. Thank you, Stephanie, for those uh, wonderful songs as we were partaking. And thank you for those who have decorated the, uh, our worship area here. Doesn't it look great? So I just, I love it. So thank you for those of you who, this is that background work you just... People who serve in the background, and, and I don't even know, I think Jen is involved, I don't even know who else is, but for all of those who did this, thank you. This is just absolutely wonderful. And uh, we are excited to be back with you today. Uh, we certainly missed you last week. Uh, Pastor Jason, thank you for preaching and getting us going on our sermon series about joy. And uh, we went away to Disney World, so uh, we were excited to do that. Uh, this is something that has been years in the making for us. We've been promising our children for years. We've been saving for this for years and even with moving and in a crazy year we've done everything that we could to protect our funds and to go on this vacation and so we did it uh, so we were excited to go away and as you probably could imagine many of you who have looked forward to something like that it kind of became all that we talked about at some point I mean every day we we're just talking about you know we're going to Disney World and we we're all just excited about that it, it's like overly consuming us you know even if things were going wrong like if the kids came back from school and, you know, I had a rough day at school. Oh, it's okay. We're going to Disney World. You know, we do like one of those things. Or, or if the food wasn't cooked just right that night, it's okay. We're going to have food in Disney World. Or, you know, if the shower, the, the water was too cold, that's all right. We're going to go to Disney. There's no reason to be upset because Disney World is coming up. And have you ever been there before? You know, something you've just looked so forward to, maybe a vacation or a hobby or something you're going to even purchase and, and it just kind of consumes you. And you have all your focus on that and, and you even put your hopes into that and I have to tell you our vacation was wonderful we had a great time we did all the things we were hoping to do we went on the rides even our kids went on the scary rides and they did great I didn't think they were going to do it we have some good pictures online too and you could see you know they were really into it some of those rides screaming and, and everything but they they got through it we had great food we took some pictures we're going to remember we got Got rained on because if you go to Florida you're gonna get rained on so that happened there was one night we got totally soaked and we enjoyed it and we came back and guess what it's gone well I'll get to the snow in a little bit I'm gonna talk about that but the vacation it's over it's over five days came and went and that's actually our first time we have never ever since we have had kids done anything longer than like a two or three day vacation five days looking forward to it but just that quickly it's gone and I stand here before you today not much different than when I left maybe a little you know a couple more pounds and maybe a shade tanner or something but for the most part I'm pretty much the same person didn't make a huge difference in my life but I put so much time and energy and focus and hope into that that. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there. That we have to be careful, especially during the Christmas season, that we don't become so overly consumed with certain things that they fill up our life and even the chaos of everything that we lose our focus in what Christmas is all about. And that is Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, I want to ask if you can open to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 17. And as we read through these verses here, we're going to just continue to break things down little by little. The first thing that it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 is this. It says, command those who are rich in this world. Those who are rich in this world. Well, who is rich? Who is rich? You all are. Every single one of you is rich without 
exception. And let's do a little test just to make sure. How many of you yesterday had a, a full square meal? Anyone have a good full square meal yesterday? Okay. How many of you have a home to call your own? You could say, yes, I live there. That's my residence. How many of you own a television or a cell phone? You know, something like that. You're rich. We are rich. We are so blessed, especially in this country. And we think about millions and millions of people around the world that they would probably say no to all three of those questions. We are truly rich. And so this message, what we're going to hear today, every word of it is for us, for all of us. It says, command those who are rich in this world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. First thing I want you to notice is that this is not a suggestion. This is actually a command. A command that is given by Paul to Timothy for the people in the church. Do not put your hope in wealth. Don't put your hope in stuff. Don't put your hope in blessings. Don't put your hope in Disney World and Mickey Mouse. Don't put your hope in retirement accounts. All of those things, don't put your hope in it. Number one, it's wrong. Number two, it's foolish. Don't put your hope in those things. Why? First of all, they're uncertain. Everything is uncertain. Everything of this world. Our bank accounts, our retirement accounts, what we own, our stuff, our vacations that we're planning, all of that stuff, it's totally uncertain. Job chapter 1 verse 21 says, The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. The things that you have today, you might not have tomorrow. A certain blessing that you are enjoying now one day might cease. That vacation might not happen. That retirement fund might not come to you. But even if you do, even if you get to enjoy some of these blessings, the second thing is this. They are only temporary. They're only temporary. Our vacation only lasted five days. Whatever accounts that you own, they will drain. Whatever material items that you own, they will fade away. Now we can get excited for these things, but they should not be the subject or object of our hope. All of these things. What does 1 Timothy 6.17 say instead? Let me read, starting from the beginning. Command those who are rich in this world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but what? To put their hope in who? In God. And there's two things about God that I want to point out that are totally different than the blessings. Number one is that God is certain. Your blessings may not be certain, but God is certain. As long as you have accepted Jesus as Savior, you have entered into a very intimate relationship. He is always there for you. I even think what it says in the book of Hebrews. What does it say about prayer? Hebrews 4.16 Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is there for you at all times. You can pray to him. He will listen to you. He will give you his full attention. Those things are certain. The only thing that might not be certain is if we are going to give Jesus our full attention. God's promises are certain. The word of God, the commands that we are given, these are certain. The expectation of us to follow God's commands. That is certain. God is always there. And every single person can know that. For sure, with certainty, it is a guarantee. The second thing is that God is eternal. When we put our hope in God, we are not putting it in some, some thing that's going to fade away. We are putting in the Almighty God, our Creator, and He is eternal. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From eternity past to eternity future, He is God. He is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 ends with this phrase. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who 
richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Everything. Everything comes from the provider. Now here's where I want to shift gears a little bit. Because my guess is that there are some of you who are already struggling this Christmas season. With being overwhelmed, with anxiety, with stress. There's all these gifts to purchase for all of these people. And, and are we going to buy the right thing? And will I get what I want for Christmas? And the parties, and we have to plan that. And the family get-togethers. And again, these are not things that are bad. It's not bad to celebrate Christmas in those ways. But that is not what Christmas is all about. Consequently, I often see a lot of disappointment also when that party or that family get together that you put all of your hope in didn't go the way that you wanted it to. Or you didn't get the right gifts for someone and there's all this devastation and disappointment. But th should this all be the center of our Christmas season? All of this stuff? See, our goal for the Christmas season should be Jesus and to celebrate Him and His birth. We should be using this season to honor Him, especially in the way that we live. That's how we find true joy. Let me read it again. Put your hope in God who richly provides you with everything for your enjoyment. He provides everything you need and He provides all of the additional blessings. It all comes from Him. He is the provider. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. All of your needs are taken care of. But notice something from this scripture, how it points out what I think are the even more important needs. Often I'm, I'm asked that question and I've heard other people talk about what are our needs? You know, well, air, right? We've got to breathe. A home and food and, and all of that. Do you know that you have even more important needs than that? That God provides for you? Wisdom. Look at it. Wisdom. Knowledge. His gospel message. The word of life itself that you can share with other people to tell them about Jesus Christ. He has given us that. Spiritual gifts. Every person who accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, they have what's called at least one spiritual gift, sometimes more. Ways that God equips us to serve and love other people. He provides us with all of this. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 to 6. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. The crops of your land and the young of your livestock. The calves of your herds. The lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trowel will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. A very specific word here to the nation of Israel. But from this we also see a simple truth that we find throughout all of Scripture. Old and New Testament. Is that God blesses his people. He just does. That's the kind of God that we serve. And a truth that we find throughout all of the Bible is also this. There is connection between these two words. Obedience and blessing. There is some kind of connection there. Now this morning we're going to be focusing on how since we know that God is our provider and we don't have to stress or have anxiety over all the provisions and all the things coming up even for this Christmas season, let's instead focus on living for Him, obeying Him with our lives. And in a few weeks we're going to talk even more specifically about how obedience does lead to blessing. But there is absolutely a connection there. God blesses. He blesses you. He blesses you. He blesses you. You are so richly blessed by your God. By your Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 6 verses 30 to 34. 
If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith! So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now I found that very interesting, very, very interesting, this connection of worrying and whether we trust God or not. I firmly believe and I have full confidence in this, and this is a problem. Maybe a way that you can even think about and examine your own life. I know I have been with mine. And it's this. Those areas of our lives where we have the greatest stress and anxiety. Usually, typically, and I think with a few exceptions, usually reveal those areas of life where we are struggling to put our hope in the Lord. Think about that. The areas where you have the greatest anxieties or stresses usually will reveal those areas of your life that you are struggling to put your hope in the Lord. And I've thought about that with my life in so many angles. And, and I think about those areas of my life where I'm the most stressed and I worry the most. And, and I kept asking myself the question, am I putting my hope in God? And a lot of times I came back with not as much as I should be. I think this is a great principle for us here. And a really important thing that we should be examining our lives over. Now, would you, would you believe it? <laughs> Sometimes even churches get this wrong. Sometimes even churches can put their hope in the wrong things. Now, there's a, a person, his name's Tom Rayner. He was, a, he, I think he still is the CEO. He's the president of Lifeway Resources. Multi, multi-time best-selling author. And, and he has this Twitter account. Some of you are familiar with Twitter. And Tom Rayner asked this question on his Twitter account. He just said, hey, all of you people out there reading my Twitter account, has your church ever argued over something that's kind of, I don't know, silly? He just put that question out there. And all of these answers started flooding in. Tom Rayner, and, and he writes books on church strategy and conflict and all that kind of stuff. Tom Rayner said even he was surprised at all the answers that came in and the kinds of answers that he received. So he took those answers and he picked his top 25 and he turned it into a list and he called it this. 25 silly things that church members fight over. Now I don't have time to name all of these here with you, but I just wanted to point out a couple. I have to say, when I came across these, I laughed. There's some of these I really laughed about. But on the other hand, I felt heartbroken. Because I know that these are the kinds of things that can happen in churches and do happen in churches. People arguing over stuff like this. Here's the first one. This was number one on his list. Argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. <laughs> That's the first one on his list. So, aren't you glad you don't go to that church, I guess, Pastor Jason? So, fifth one, look at this. A church argument and to vote to decide if the clock in the worship center should be removed. And I thought, you know, if I preach too long, you might be arguing to put one in here. So I guess there's one there. But let's fill this place with clocks so I don't go over time. The ninth one, a dispute over whether the worship leader should have his shoes on during the service. Why do they keep picking on the worship leaders? I don't know. <laughs> but I can tell you this, and in all honesty, in the many churches that I've, I've been a part of or served with, worship leaders have a hard job. It is, it is very difficult what they do. And Pastor Jason, I think, he gives 100%. He gives his heart. And I just, I hope that you appreciate him and his wife, Stephanie, for all they do. Seriously. You can, you can do the research. To be a worship pastor is very, very difficult. Uh, if there's something that, that people can argue over, it usually has something to do with what a worship pastor is involved with. So... There was this other one, number 10, a big church argument over the discovery that the church budget was off by 10 cents. So they argued, argued, argued. Finally, someone gave a dime and they settled the issue. 
Number 11, a despite, uh, I'm sorry, a dispute in the church because the Lord's Supper had cranberry grape juice instead of regular grape juice. So, deacons, were we okay there today? Or maybe there's some kind of, I don't know, maybe a verse against that, I don't know. Number 14, two different churches, this one just, I couldn't believe this. Two different church. this is real by the way, this really happened. Two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee. One of the churches, they moved from Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand, and the other church they moved simply to a stronger blend and members left the church in the later example this really happened this really ha now I love my coffee but I love my church family more number 18 a disagreement over the term pot luck instead of pot blessing <laughs> 21 some church members left the church because one church hit the vacuum cleaner church member hit the vacuum cleaner from other people it resulted in a major fight and split. And last one I want to share, number 23. A dispute over whether the church should allow people to wear black t-shirts. Since they believe black is the color of the devil. I'm pretty sure that God created the entire color spectrum, but maybe I missed something there. You know, and, and we might think this is ridiculous. You know, we hear about these things from the outside. We think this is totally ridiculous. But I thought about the question, what if we were in their shoes? What if we grew up in these churches? What if there were certain standards, they just always had been that way, and even just a small change, and, and that really challenged us, would we be fighting over the same things? And we might be, I don't know. But here is a truth. I firmly believe that when this kind of stuff happens, it is because people are putting their hope in the wrong things. They're looking for some kind of predefined or predetermined version of joy rather than looking to Jesus who provides all the joy. And the saddest thing I know is that as many churches are spending so many hours arguing and fighting over stuff like this, there are millions of people that do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. And they don't want anything to do with the church. And it's probably four reasons such as this. We need to put our hope in the Lord. Him and Him only. So what should we do instead? If we're going to put our hope in Jesus, what should we do? What does Paul tell Timothy to tell these members of the church? He says this, verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, and to be willing to share. If you are looking for joy this Christmas season, I'm telling you, it is found in things like this. This really brings us to the heart of our issue. We need to put our hope in our provider instead of the provisions and choose to live for him in these kinds of ways. Four ways that Paul says here. Number one, do what is right as opposed to what is wrong. Live righteously. Follow God's commands and, and the ways he tells you to live. Number two, do good deeds. Go out of your way. Take that initiative. Do even little deeds for people. Good deeds. And I'm going to give you some very practical, simple examples even for the Christmas season. Number three, be generous. Number four, share. There's true joy in all of those things. What if? What if we went into this Christmas season with a whole different perspective? Instead of thinking about all those other things that are fun for Christmas time and the gifts and the decorations and the, the meals and all of that. And those are fun. We put our greatest focus and our greatest hope in Jesus, remembering his birth and saying, because of him, we want to live for you this Christmas season, Lord. We want to do things like this, these four things. So let me give you some practical examples. Some of you might know this. Some of you might not. Do we have those four still listed up there? Keep your eyes on those four. One, two, three, four. Okay. I used to work with security. I was a member of a security team for a mall. It was between Trenton, New Jersey and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And let me tell you, there was a lot of crime that happened in this mall. Now, of all the days of the year, the one day of the year where I probably saw those four things the least was Black Friday. 
When I would be on, all those things you see on television and you hear about and read about, that really does happen. The fights that happen, that people break out in because of the, what they're trying to buy and, and pulling things out of each other's hands and, and the anger. And I would see that. Very opposite of these four things. And there was no joy in that for those people. Now, I know some of you, you're probably thinking, I don't, I don't get into any of that stuff. I don't have any Black Friday throwdowns. But for the Christmas season, there are some other things that can get us a little bit upset. Parking spaces. The coveted, close parking space, especially during the Christmas season. You ever see this happen? Maybe you experienced it. And there's that close parking space and you go to pull in somebody right in front of you. And usually with a smile or something. I used to drive a mobile unit when I was on security. I lost count of how many times I would see people angry at each other, fighting over these parking spots. It's like, come on! We're fighting over parking spots? You want true joy? How about this? Love other people. Say, you know, I'm going to park at the faraway spot today. Intentionally, I want everybody else to be blessed and they have to walk less than I would. Do something like that. Little things that can change the world. And let me tell you, you don't have to just wait until shopping time for Christmas. You can do it all the time. Maybe even here at church, we have a parking lot that's far away. And, and if you're able to walk and, and you have no problem doing that, maybe that's your heart. And you say, I'm going to park farther away today so that everybody else can have the closer spots. One thing that I love to do is hold doors for people. I think of that as a ministry. You know, you can kind of open the door, get your family inside, just let it go. But I'll always look back. Is there more people coming? And just hold that door for them. And there, there's joy in that. They're so thankful that you held the door. Just something simple like that. Let me give you another example. And this actually comes in the form of a story. We were coming back from our vacation... And believe it or not, we had to land in Pittsburgh because that's where we bought our plane tickets before we moved. We couldn't change our flight, so we had to land in Pittsburgh and, and drive back. But as we came down from the clouds to land in Pittsburgh, it was snowing. And my wife and I, we looked at each other and we just went... We were even talking about that. So we don't want to go back to the snow and the cold and all of that. And, and we came down from the clouds. And in front of us, there was, I think it was some kind of a sports team. It was all these like teenage girls, maybe a soccer team or something. We came down from these clouds and they're all like, ah, It's snowing! And they're all excited. I've never seen the snow before. Oh, isn't it wonderful? It's so beautiful. I even heard one of them saying, Let's put it in a jar and take it back home with us. And I'm thinking... You don't know what you're getting excited about here. Like, you have no clue. Would you like to trade, you know? And, and I was just taken back by how excited they were over something that we were dreading. But the reality is, we get snow. And we get lots of it. Shovel it for someone. There's joy in that. Shovel somebody's driveway. Some, shovel somebody's walkway. Maybe someone you know, they can't get out of their house very easily. They can't shovel that well on their own. Go to that person's house. Even just your neighbor. There's joy in living in these ways that the Bible says that we should. Let me give you one more illustration. I'm not saying you have to do this. This was a, an extreme example. From our last church, somebody shared it with me and I, I couldn't believe this. They said this, when Christmas time comes, we don't put up the decorations. We don't exchange presents. We don't have those family meals. We don't do any of that stuff. For Christmas time, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, we go and serve somewhere. We'll go to a local soup kitchen. We'll volunteer with the Salvation Army in some way. Maybe they've made some blankets or they have some jackets and they'll go to an area of the city. They know that there's homeless people and they just hand that out at Christmas time. And I, I kind of, I'm sad to say this, but kind of didn't believe them. So I'm like, really? Like you guys don't open any presents? Not even like one? Like you don't even sneak one in? I said, we have no need to. We don't need to open any gifts. Because when we go and serve people and we experience their response, there is joy in that. When they can receive from us the love of Jesus and that we're just serving them in Jesus' name, there is true, incredible joy in that. And for them, they said, that was their gift every year. 
I don't know how God is going to lead you this season, but just think about some of these things. Let's not get so overwhelmed with the busyness and chaos of Christmas that we miss what's most important. Focusing on Jesus and living for him. Lastly, here's a couple more ideas. Be generous and share. Now I love Christmas time because of the food. You go into some of the supermarkets and you'll see things this time of year that you never see any other time. But when you go to pick up those, those easy baked cookies or something, ask yourself this question. Who can I give them to? Who can I bake them for? Maybe your neighbor. Maybe a local uh, like volunteer fire department or something like that. Maybe the teacher that your child uh, is under at their school. And it doesn't have to be cookies. It could be a fruit basket. It could be a meal. Let's share with one another and especially this idea. Maybe you will have some kind of a family get together or a meal for Christmas. Do you know someone that doesn't have anybody to get together with? Someone that might be spending Christmas alone. Invite that person over. Share in the joy of being generous with what you have with them. What happens, it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 19. It says, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So that they may take hold of the life that was truly life. Guys, this is how life is meant to be lived. I firmly believe, and this is, this is kingdom living here, what we're talking about. This is heavenly living. I believe when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any Black Friday sales. It's not going to be there. I believe when we get to heaven, we're not going to be fighting over parking spots. Or I don't know what we'll be driving or using. But whatever it is, we're not going to be fighting over those spots. We're not going to be angry at people when they get in our way. If we're in a line. No, this is kingdom living. And the great thing is, you can live this way right now. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. And it's really what God even expects of us. So let's experience this true and incredible joy this Christmas season. That is my encouragement to you. Let this be your perspective. Celebrate Jesus. Focus on him. He was born to come into this world for you and for all. To offer them salvation. And because of that, most importantly, how does he want you to live? It's in these ways. Let's pray together as the worship team comes forward at this time. Remember at the end of our song, don't take off. Because we're going to have a baptism. Uh, and also Andreas and Brian, if you can come up to the front here, we'll meet in this room. Let's all pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that we can have opportunities to live for you in such great ways, Lord. You have given us opportunity after opportunity every single day. People who are in need, people who are without. Opportunities we can bless others, serve others, love others, God. And I pray that that would be our heart this Christmas season. Father, we do not want to get overwhelmed in, in all the chaos and busyness this time. God, we want to honor your son. We want to celebrate his birth. And in doing that, we want to do it with our lives and the way that we live in these four ways and many other ways as well as are written in your scripture. Thank you for these opportunities. Jesus, thank you for how you've served us. You are the serving Savior. We think of even how you washed the disciples' feet. That is your heart. That is your example. And now we want to do the same. We love you. We thank you. We celebrate you as our Savior. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. At this time, we are going to uh, continue our worship this morning through our giving. Uh, God, as Pastor Joel has said, has given us so much to be thankful for. So much that uh, he's given to us to enjoy. And uh, this time of our service is about saying thank you. It's about giving back to, to God and what he has done and what he is doing here um, and being a part of that. Um, so I, I want to express that there's no obligation to give. Um, God says that he loves a cheerful giver. So uh, for those of you who are prepared to do that this morning, that's what this time is for. Let's go ahead and, and uh, pray uh, as we accept the morning's offering. God, we do thank you for your gifts. They are they're precious to us. Sometimes more than they ought to be. Um, but God, we do thank you for what you have given. God, help us to hold loosely to them though so that, uh, so that we can truly be thankful to you for them. 
Um, and God, we just ask that, uh, that you would take the gifts that we, we are giving back to you this morning and uh, uh, multiply them and, and help them to be used for your glory. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before we get to the baptism, we've got one last Christmas carol to enjoy together. This is, uh, What Child Is This? now you hear me okay same sounds the same up here but out there it must be different so but I want to share Andreas's testimony with you before Andreas knew Jesus he was not a nice person and he did some bad things this all began to change in 1982 during this time Andreas turned his life over to Jesus who began working in his life and turning him into a new person during this same year while Andreas was in Jordan, he asked for God's help to quit his alcohol. In 1986, God again helped Andreas and kept him from uh, traveling with a convoy. The next morning, Andreas found out that the group he was traveling with had been bombed, but God had saved his life. In 1990, while he was driving truck, Andreas was falsely imprisoned and he was tortured because they believed he was an American. But God protected and provided for Andreas even when he felt that he could not take any more. God would continue to send more help for Andreas. There was a man that was called Milat, I think. And uh, this was someone Andreas was actually mistreating at the time. But this man would tell Andreas, I'm going to pray for you. And I think it's also important that you pray 
to God. And that moment for Andreas was a very big turning point also in his life. There's so many more stories about God saving grace for his, his life, including how God even divinely guided him here after he made a wrong turn. God brought him here to Norwich. This is an amazing story, and if you ever get the opportunity, I, I would say ask him about that. It's a great story, and you'd want to hear it. But now Andreas is living to honor Jesus with his life. He loves to help with the food distribution over here at the church. He loves to share Jesus' love with his neighbors. And he faithfully attends church and connect group every week. Since Andreas is no longer able to be with his biological family, he considers this church to be his family. And he is very thankful for all of you who continue to encourage him to live for Jesus every day. Andreas has decided to be baptized because he wants everyone to know that he has put all of his trust in Jesus. Amen. So with that, Andreas, I'm going to bring you over here with me. And Brian's going to come over that way. We're going to baptize you together. Before that, I have a couple questions to ask you. First, I want to ask, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Amen, Lord. And is it your desire to follow him through the waters of believer's baptism and live for him all the days of your life? Amen, Lord. Then based on your testimony, it is our privilege to baptize you, our brother Andreas, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Rise and walk in newness of life. Amen. With Thank that, you. anything you want to say? Thank you. I have my mom and I have two sisters. God gave me Dana Nawal and my mom Rita. I have a real two sisters, one in Germany, one in Australia. My mom, she's uh, far away for me. I left my mom, I was 14 years old boy. I saw my mom 30 years later or 29 years later, but again I lost my mom, she's in Germany. I got my beautiful mom, she's Amen. right there. Amen, alright. And I got my two sisters. Amen. Well let's praise God, so wonderful. Thank you Andreas. I have my big brother. <laughs> I have a family. God now, bless you guys. Now let me tell you... Um, in Andreas being baptized today, this fulfills really the last thing we'd need for him to be considered as a member for our church, which the deacon board is presenting him as a potential candidate, as well as Rebecca Clark. We will be voting on both of them in two weeks. So another great thing we can celebrate in together. What a great way to end our service. So I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you all. May you go in the grace and peace of Jesus, especially as we continue into this Christmas season. God bless you all. Thank Amen. you.